It's now my great privilege to introduce our 2013 Convocation guest speaker, Maureen McKinnon. Maureen's story is that of perseverance and overcoming adversity. In 1992, a 13-foot fall left her paralyzed from the waist down, but she worked through her rehabilitation program and eventually continued her pre-injury avocation of sailing. In 2001, she became the first woman to join the U.S. sailing team and the first woman to win a spot on the U.S. Paralympic sailing team. In 2008, she became the first woman to represent the United States in sailing at the Paralympic Games in Beijing, China. Together with fellow crewman Nick Scandone, Maureen won the gold medal for the SCUD 18 class. Her victory made her the first woman and first disabled sailor to receive a gold medal in the sport of sailing worldwide. Maureen has compiled an impressive resume as an athlete and disability advocate. In 2009, she was named the U.S. Olympic Sailing Committee's Paralympic Sportswoman of the Year and received the Paul C. Hearn Leadership Award from the American Association of Persons with Disabilities. The Hearn Leadership Award came with a grant allowing Maureen to expand the work of Sail, Challenge, Inspire, Incorporated, a nonprofit which she founded, co-founded to promote competitive disabled sailing programs in Massachusetts. Maureen's also been named the New England Wheelchair Athletic Association Female Athlete of the Year, won the Making a Difference Award from the Zonta Club, and earned the George Washington Medal of Honor from the Freedoms Foundation. From 2007 until 2012, she worked as the adaptive directors at the Piers Park Sailing Center, where she pioneered an innovative sailing program that won two national awards for its work with adults and youth with disabilities. Today, the program is recognized as the national leader in disabled sailing and serves as a model for other centers. Today, Maureen is a keynote, public, and motivational speaker, as well as an advocate for persons with disabilities. She speaks at many universities and has lectured to our occupational therapy classes for 12 years. Maureen's a member of the Board of Directors of the U.S. Sailing Association and a variety of other associations that promote recreation and accessible activities for this, the disabled. Maureen's the mother of a, of a seven and 13 year old, both of whom were born after her injury and often mentors other mothers who are dealing with paralysis. She's campaigned for four Paralympics, including Athens 2004 and London 2012, and she's pursuing the next games in Rio de Janeiro in 2016. Maureen embodies the type of inspirational commitment to disability rights and the rehabilitation sciences taught at Sargent College and practiced by our students, faculty, and alumni. As an athlete, advocate, and a role model, she's an ideal commencement speaker and an inspiration to us all. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Maureen McKinnon. There have been a few, too many, of these intersections in my life and my family's life, though. And there were the big ones. My paralysis, my back surgery, childbirth as a paraplegic, my son's cancer, and the three blood clots that nearly got me. There were the small ones, too. Each of these events 
took me back into some type of rehab where the care I received and the ex was excellent and for which I remain so grateful. Each one required OTs and PTs to get me back to the quality of life I wanted and needed. Okay, I'll begin with the chair. I'm sure you're all wondering. I'm an L1 paraplegic incomplete. At age 30, on a beautiful sunny day in Maine, I tripped on a rope. I fell 13 feet in a sitting position like this and landed and broke my back. I shattered L1 and I have a titanium brace that holds my back together. I worked very hard to get stronger and to learn all the skills that I needed from the good PTs and OTs, docs and nurses that kicked my butt while rehabbing. I remember saying to an OT, I didn't want to do therapy. I wanted to skip that day. It was too hard to get out of bed that day. And she said, well, you do your transfers from the right, correct? Well, if you think that's tough, let's try doing them on the left side today. That way I can show you what truly hard is. In other words, she got me out of bed. It was on the right side, but she made the right side seem like it was an easy thing to do that day. So that's the kind of butt kicking I'm talking about. That's kind of the inspiration that you all in your medical careers will have the opportunity to do. And it does influence us. You're at a very important intersection at that moment with people. I had some of the best PTs, OTs, and nurses that I could have had. They taught me perspective, as well as the skills to deal with all the new side effects of paralysis. I really wanted to walk out of that rehab, just as about 90% of all your patients probably will with a spinal cord injury. But I left in a wheelchair at noon, found myself at my workbench at one, and I was sound asleep by three. Wheeling myself around for just a few hours proved to be exhausting. I continued my outpatient rehab and got stronger week by week and continued those water exercises I was taught for 11 years. I now do three quarters of a mile walking upright on a treadmill with carbon fiber braces. You never know what the outcome is really going to be, even then. I set out for a typical life, a job, a husband, a two-story house, babies, a white picket fence, but I had to fight for all these things. As a female para, I had few mentors. As you know, spinal cord injury is mostly a male-dominated event. I had to pave the path for myself and figure it all out as a paraplegic. So a little bit about my sailing. Though sailboat racing was a sport that I only did casually, I didn't realize it mattered until I didn't have it anymore. Foolishly, I quit the sport after trying a very, rather non-empowering sailing experience where it was therapeutic sailing. They took me out for a boat ride and then gave me a little pat on the head when I was done. They wouldn't allow me to touch the ropes. That's the sheets for sailors out there. And they wouldn't allow me to steer and I didn't really participate. I left the dock crying. I tried the boats that I used to sail before the J24s, and they healed too much. I found myself just dangling in the cockpit, holding on to the boat stanchion. That didn't work either. But a few years later, after just kayaking rather than sailing, I met a mentor. His name was Rick Dorr, a fellow paraplegic. He changed my entire life's trajectory by saying one thing to me. Once a sailor, always a sailor. You need to get back out there. He encouraged me to try a sonar. 
a sonar is one of the boats that's used in the Paralympics. I did that very next Wednesday. I found myself, by the end of that summer, answering an email, a very simple email, looking for crew. It was for the World Championships. I answered and found myself in Connecticut for a three-day regatta. And who greeted me at the dock? That same guy, that same sailing paraplegic, Rick Dorr. I was a little bit late, and he said, come on, get in the boat. And there I was at a World Championships. <laughs> it was the same guy that had pushed me to do all that earlier, and I was grateful. During that regatta, a 35 knot gale blew through, and a lot of boats quit. We didn't. By the end of the regatta, he asked me one simple question. So want a campaign for Athens 2004? Want to go for a gold medal in the Paralympics? What do you think I said? So I accepted that challenge, and I went from just a little harbor in Marblehead to the national level, and from the national level to the worldwide stage. That team, that team ultimately finished third, and not well enough to go to the Athens Games, but I was hooked. And now the dream of a gold medal was locked in. So now my journey to China, to Beijing. In the spring of 2007, before the USA trials for the Beijing Games, I teamed up on a different boat called the Scud 18 with the West Coast superstar named Nick Scandone. Nick had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and was diagnosed some three years prior. When he was able-bodied, he had a good deal of sailing successes and had finished third in the Olympic trials in the 470s. Though I had tried out for his team in January, I didn't get the call until Easter morning. I picked up the phone, it was Nick. Marine, I'd like to invite you to be on my team and go get a gold in China. Though I was waiting for this call forever, I had to go. I said, I have a house full of guests and they're all walking in for dinner. I can't talk, but I accepted his invitation nonetheless. I accepted knowing that the likelihood that he would even make it to China alive was actually rather dim. The games would be year six of a disease that usually takes its victims in two to four years post-diagnosis. What I did know for sure was two things. He wasn't going down without a fight. And the second thing I knew is that if I only had one day to sail with Nick, one day, he was that brilliant of a sailor that I would learn something important from him. And that I would also be enriched by just being with him and seeing the challenges that he had as a fellow human being. I began flying to California to train with Nick. He had assembled a number of Olympic level training partners to get this boat up to speed. We did four day training sessions. When we got to our first regatta, we won it. We continued practicing and racing that summer up to the fall of the US trials, often finishing first, or at least a podium finish. By the time we got to the trials that fall, it was a cold, cold fall in October in Newport, and Nick had atrophied down to about 95 pounds. The weather was particularly unbearable for this West Coast guy. Nick persevered nonetheless. Every 40 degree morning, we would, he would listen to his inspirational song by Nick, Nickelback, Rockstar. He'd get in the boat, all bundled up in ski gear. We would win race after race. By the second to the last day, we had actually sewn up the US trials mathematically. Point-wise, no one could beat us. So we took the last day off. We went and watched the action of everyone else trying to fight for their spot for the US trials for China. We also knew, as we sat on that 60-foot yacht watching everybody, that it was second place that everybody wanted in the Scud 18 class. The rules governed that if the Scud 18 um, skipper or crew from the winning team needed to be replaced, 
the second place team would go. Basically, we all knew that everyone in the sport was expecting Nick to die before the games. We celebrated our victory, and in sh three short months, my then husband and I were delivered some devastating news. Our son had medulloblastoma, M3 stage. He was two and a half. He was gonna require six months of chemo, 21 days at a time, and three months of proton beam radiation, and his chances for living were 20%. The games were nine months, exactly. I could always try for another games, but Nick, Nick's survival was 0%. Initially, I knew I had to make a decision. Here I was at the top of my game in my Paralympic training year, having won the right to represent my country in the sport that I loved. Yet Nick was so frail that he, not, he could not come east to train with me. So I could be with my son, and it was well known that Nick wasn't making it to the next games. Instead of thinking about how to quit, we began to think instead of what we needed to make it work. We rallied up friends, neighbors, fellow sailors, our Unitarian Universalist faith community. These faith folks babysat my then seven-year-old, arranged play dates, made meals, sat in the hospital, carpooled, raised donations, and even mowed our lawn. With a four-day work week, I never missed one day of work. I spent three days a week with my son at MGH during his chemo treatments. And every third week, I'd hop on a plane to California, train four days, take the red eye back to Logan, and be at my desk at 8.30 that morning on Monday. Somehow, it all worked. And my son finished his chemo treatments, cancer-free, on the same day I left on a plane to go to China. <sighs> Thank you. It's all just luck. When we got to China, Nick said to me on the morning of the race day, well, Maureen, we made it. No one thought we would. Now let's go win this thing and take home a gold. We've already done the hard part. And we did just that. And we did it a day early, again. We achieved both our dreams against pretty much every odd. Nick sadly passed away January 2nd, just three months after we won that gold. Graduates, I believe in luck. I believe in hard work. I believe you can will yourself to live. I believe in not having anyone determine what I can or cannot do. I believe that my experiences and all the good health care molded all of my positive outcomes. Now graduates, go. Go and mold the outcomes of people who with life-altering diseases diagnoses into a positive one. I hope that your clients and patients that you will intersect with in your upcoming careers will know that they were lucky, lucky to have had you in their healthcare experience. Thank you. <laughs>